There is a hidden beauty to the seemingly desolate prairies of eastern Colorado and a unique history that seldom receives attention. More than 100 little spots on the map from the 19th and early 20th centuries have now greatly disappeared or been transformed. They came for many reasons and faced many hardships, but some events were so extreme they destroyed all the pioneers had worked for. Incorrect farming techniques, applied by the farmers themselves, repeated droughts, and high winds led to the Dust Bowl, which parched many budding agricultural towns. The nationwide Great Depression ruined local businesses and, coincidentally, occurred during the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. Understandably, these disasters were the biggest events that helped create many of Colorado's ghost towns, but there were other reasons as well. While aspiring souls from all walks of life once saw this area as a promised land and second chance at life, not all places on the Colorado Plains were sites of American dreams, but American anguish. What follows is only a small anthology of noteworthy establishments. Regardless of their perceived place in history, they all deserve to be remembered and learned from. On April 19, 1946, an irregular classified advertisement appeared in the Greeley Tribune. It said the entire town of Deerfield in Weld County, Colorado was up for sale. The author of the ad had been an ailing black man named Oliver Jackson. The property for sale had been his novel Dream, which 30 years earlier was the opposite of the dead little village it had become. Earlier, Jackson had believed that disenfranchised blacks could regain their dignity and independence through an agricultural experiment on the Colorado Plains here. Thus, Deerfield had been born. Colonization at Deerfield began in 1911. The first years at the colony were the most difficult for the gallant few who braved a new start on the rugged prairie. In time, Jackson persuaded Moore to join the endeavor. Deerfield soon became a social center and popular destination for travelers. There was a church, two schools, cafe, filling station, lodge, and a social center called the Barn Pavilion. By 1921, there were close to 700 brave souls living in Deerfield with homes and businesses. The cost of a town lot was only $25. The ambition of reaching a population of 2,000 never happened. Farming and economic problems of the 1930s made an already delicate project even harder to endure. Many colonists left, and by 1940, the noble settlement had lost nearly all of its residents. The streets became deserted, but many original buildings remained. Jackson received no response in his effort to sell his dream venture turned ghost town in 1946. One of the last African Americans to leave Deerfield, he died in 1949, defiant to failure. Though some towns were founded by humanitarians, others were founded by adventurers who also had impossible goals. Soldier of Fortune James Bolger may have been of the latter stock. He was a colorful but sad character who died in obscurity and left a legacy of two dead towns. A couple of Bolger's exploits took place not abroad, but in Larimer County, Colorado, around 1909. Although small in size, he had a mighty ego and intended to build a great town named after himself. A railroad would soon be passing through his town site, and the possibility of a depot meant the town would connect to the outside world. Bolger managed to persuade a few people to come to the area and join him. Sources suggest that a hotel, post office, lumber yard, general store, and blacksmith shop were all set up there. Everybody eagerly awaited the arrival of the railroad that would aid the town. 
Anticipation gave way to disappointment after plans didn't work out with the railroad, so Bolger created a second town a few miles to the south of his first. According to witnesses, the town was literally picked up and moved to its new location. The streets of the town had imposing names such as Broadway and New York, but the lots on most of these avenues remained vacant. Another problem for Bolger was his addiction to alcohol and reputation for being a hot-tempered cowboy who irritated authorities. He was a proud man and easily insulted. During an altercation in Denver in 1914, he killed a hotel owner. Bolger was arrested and the courts tried and convicted him of homicide. He maintained his innocence for the rest of his life and tenaciously held on to hopes of returning to his town someday. Regrettably, the adventurer withered away in prison and so did his dream cities on the front range. Authorities released him in 1961, but his towns had long since disappeared. Before cars and highways, there were trains and railroads. Arroyo, like many other prairie places in Cheyenne County, began life as a stop on the Union Pacific Railroad. Fifteen people lived in Arroyo in 1899. There were few businesses at first, but the community slowly grew around the popular J.O.D. Ranch and later around a major highway that ran through the town. Arroyo depended on U.S. Highway 40 as a link to the outside world. The route dates from the 1920s and was one of America's first coast-to-coast -coast highways spanning more than 3,000 miles. Officials eventually rerouted the road, thereby bypassing the little town by only a couple of miles. This action stranded Arroyo, and without a major highway, the fate of the community was sealed. In 1965, authorities closed the post office. Soon, only a one-room school on a hill overlooking the abandoned mercantile store, hotel, gas station, and a few old houses remain. The last resident of Arroyo was responsible for a unique addition to the town, a lighthouse sculpted from pieces of scrap. Another town birthed by a railroad was Kyoto in Weld County. A popular legend suggests the name could be of American Indian origin, which means the light is out. Although the light of the town has indeed been out for some time, it had once shone brightly. The dawn of Kyoto came in 1888 when the Lincoln Land Company established the town. The company, a subsidiary of the Chicago, Burlington and Quincy Railroad, had plans to develop the site along the railway that stretched from Sterling, Colorado to Cheyenne, Wyoming. The year 1919 proved to be an exciting one for Kyoto settlers. The expanding community was incorporated, and a new water tower provided waterworks and fire protection. Rare was it that a prairie community could afford to boast real fire hydrants on its streets. Even though there were fewer than 200 people living there, Kyoto had become a city on the high plains. Low wheat prices, a harsh climate, and raw farming practices that resulted in the Dust Bowl forced many farms and businesses into ruin. The town's water system, although elaborate, rarely provided water. These reasons caused many to abandon their dreams of prairie prosperity at Kyoto, and by 1941, there were only a few dozen people left. After the school dismissed classes in 1951, the doors never reopened. The school building, a grand hotel, and many other buildings in the town were destroyed. Even after services ended, a few residents stayed behind and kept Kyoto Incorporated until 1991. Today, Kyoto is most identifiable by the large water tower that once provided its residents with running water. Among other ruins are fire hydrants on lonely street corners marking the old site of Kyoto where, prophetically, the light has been extinguished. Prairie playgrounds in eastern Colorado included Toonerville and Cornish. Named for Fontaine Fox's comical cartoon about a small town and its rickety trolley, Toonerville was a place of fun in Bent County. Baseball games, rodeos, dances, and lots of imagination provided a respite from hard times of the 1930s for local residents. As times got tougher, though, many people left the area, and the pretend town of Toonerville became a memory. 
1934, the little hamlet of Cornish in Weld County became world famous when local residents put on a display of ancient artifacts found in the area. Known as the Stone Age Fair, the annual event would attract as many as 10,000 people. The festival was eventually moved to nearby Loveland, and the town of Cornish lost its railroad and post office in the 1960s. Although the Colorado prairies were once the destination of countless settlers, not all who lived on the plains were there because they wanted to be. The decaying monument to one of the darker chapters of American history, Amachi was a place of forced inhabitation in southeast Colorado. Before World War II, nearly 130,000 people of Japanese descent lived in the United States. Most were American-born and living on the West Coast. After the bombing at Pearl Harbor in 1941, there was official concern that people of Japanese ancestry, American citizens or not, were potential hazards whose allegiance might be to Japan rather than to the United States. President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 in February 1942, which led to mandatory evacuation of these people from their homes and into internment camps. During war, many believed that civil rights of citizens could be set aside for security reasons. The affected population had to sell their businesses and homes at sacrifice prices. Amachi was one of ten internment camps set up by the War Relocation Authority in western states. During its peak, Amachi became home to nearly 8,000 people held against their will on the prairie, and was one of the largest communities in eastern Colorado at the time. Although the residents of Amachi felt humiliated, they did their best to make their stay at the crowded camp tolerable. Many Japanese Americans remained patriotic, some going so far as to volunteer for a special military unit that became highly decorated during World War II. Propaganda films like this show mostly content internees. What the films do not show are the razor wire and armed guards common of the camps. After the war ended with a victory for the Allies, the internment facilities closed. The internees were free but faced a difficult reconstruction. In 1988, President Ronald Reagan signed legislation which offered formal apologies and compensation to survivors. Hysteria, racism, and poor leadership were reasons listed for the imprisonment. Amachi is now protected as a National Historic Site, a small cemetery, and a memorial commemorating 31 Amachi residents who gave their lives fighting for this nation stands proudly there. Nearby are hundreds of acres where crumbling walls and foundations mark one of the most shameful chapters in American history. An intriguing aspect of the early settlement of Colorado was the role that organized colonization played. Organizers often formed colony bodies in eastern states and then located to Colorado, where members worked in a communal effort to forge a city out of the wilderness. Some were legitimate and successful, while others frauds and disasters. One such lie, Green City, was named for scheme promoter David S. Green in the 1870s. The advertisements that had convinced pioneers to sell everything and come westward and settle a new colony had promised a growing city on the banks of the South Platte River. More than 5,000 lots were for sale on streets named after states. There were parks and a picturesque town square. Advertisements also depicted a wide, deep South Platte, with steamships navigating their way to and from Green City. A large port at the riverbank made it possible to receive or ship passengers and goods. Eager settlers arriving at their new home at Green City discovered that reality was quite different from what they had been told. The city harbor, as depicted in the promotions, was nothing more than a muddy bank on a small river. Having left everything behind, most had no choice but to stay and make the best of their hideous predicament. Irrigation problems Cold winters and isolation were other hardships that made life problematic for Green City settlers. Within a few years of its establishment, many abandoned the colony. Today, 
Nothing remains of Green City, a town built on alluring but fraudulent promises. Another town named after an infamous character was Shivington in Kiowa County. The town's namesake, Colonel John Shivington, was responsible for an act of viciousness called the Sand Creek Massacre. Before the incident at Sand Creek, Shivington played a large role in the limited American Civil War that took place in the West. In March of 1862, this man successfully drove back an advancing unit of Confederate soldiers at Glorieta Pass, New Mexico, preventing a Confederate invasion of the Western United States. In the 1860s, anti-native sentiment was running high in Colorado. John Shivington, now interested in politics, capitalized on this feeling by threatening to wipe out the indigenous population for good. In the early morning of November 29, 1864, Shivington and his unit stood overlooking a peaceful camp of Arapaho and Cheyenne at Sand Creek in southeast Colorado. Witnesses later recalled Shivington giving the order to kill and scalp all, despite the high number of elderly and children present. On that day, the soldiers killed at least 150 American Indians at their camp and along the creek where many had run trying to escape the assault. Some attackers sexually mutilated bodies, while others refused to cooperate altogether. Later a scandal developed, and with a tarnished image, Shivington's military and political future ended. Town builders named a community after the infamous Colonel, a few miles to the south of where the massacre took place. The Missouri Pacific Railroad, which intended to use the town as an important rail center, planned a Plains metropolis. The community flourished for a while after its creation in the late 1880s, but the boom was short-lived due to water problems. John Shivington died in the late 1890s. The little town named for him eventually died too, in a final twist of historic irony. While the dead town may serve as a bizarre legacy in tribute to this controversial man, it's probably not the legacy that John Shivington had in mind. When one thinks of the Wild West, visions of Tombstone, Arizona or Dodge City, Kansas often come to mind. The eastern plains of Colorado, too, were once dotted with cattle towns and unruly characters. Located in Baca County in southeastern Colorado, three towns took the names of larger eastern counterparts. Boston, in particular, was one of several lawless towns in the region sustained by the cattle industry. Around 1887, Boston became one of the more sizable towns in the county. Not surprisingly, many of the businesses there were saloons and brothels. Newspapers of the time attest that Boston was the site of several vicious episodes. The community was notorious for frontier hostility created by both villains and lawmen. The line separating good and bad may have been blurrier than some today might like to think. Despite later depictions in fiction, the frontier west wasn't a place of just black and white, but included a whole gray area in between. Among the various cliques in Boston were ranch detectives employed to protect their employers' interests. Private police more than anything else, these hired agents enforced anyone's law for a price. Eventually, the Boston public decided they had had enough of these unregulated enforcers, and a resulting confrontation among the town's factions left much of the town wrecked. The wild days of the Old West were numbered as law replaced lawlessness. By 1893, there was no longer mail service in Boston, a sign the booming town was going bust after a few violent years. Boston slowly faded away, remembered only in the newspapers and by an aging few. Because of its early abandonment, the last physical remains of this town and other wild cow towns disappeared long ago. Boston is unique, though, because of the cemetery left behind displaying its name. Another unfortunate incident that cost the lives of countless innocents occurred at the town of Ludlow in Los Animas County. Mine workers' uprisings were commonplace during the early 20th century throughout America, but an event here was severe enough to gain such infamous labels as America's Second Civil War. 
It was a dark period in Colorado's history and started with a tragedy called the Battle of Ludlow, described by witnesses as a massacre. Ludlow was one of many privately owned towns controlled by the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. The CF&I had other towns and mines clustered in the vicinity. In 1907, CF&I operated 28 coal mines in southern Colorado and had its own railroad to serve its properties. Workers and their families accounted for nearly 57,000 people. Conditions in area mines were perilous. Besides the threat of falling ceiling debris, miners faced the possibility of underground explosions. Long hours, little pay, and few labor laws caused chronic depression among many. After the end of a long, grueling day toiling in the mines, going home was no easier. Paid only with scrip, or company money, miners had to spend what little they had earned in company-owned stores and housing, which charged exorbitant prices. In September of 1913, the labor organization representing the miners failed to secure better conditions for its workers. A huge strike resulted that set in motion the wheels for a domestic nightmare. Some 1,200 miners and their families set up camp in a nearby tent colony after the company evicted them from employee housing. Tensions between the strikers and soldiers protecting company interests climaxed on April 20, 1914. Colorado militia and trigger-happy company-hired agents attacked and then burned to the ground the tent colony. Nearly two dozen were killed. Sadly, half of the deaths were women and children. Violence quickly spread throughout the region. The conflict ended only after the government sent federal troops to quell the hostility. The mining union later called off the strike in December of 1914. Although the Coalfield War ended without gains for the strikers, the disaster eventually brought undeniable credibility to the miners' allegations of brutality and the beginnings of national sympathy for the miners and their families. Today, a monument erected by the United Mine Workers of America stands over the area where several women and children died after taking refuge in a dugout. The spot infamously became known as the Black Hole. The tall marker stands over several foundations and deserted buildings that remain of Ludlow. Within the area are other coalfield ghost towns, such as Berwind and Hastings. Although most of the towns depicted in this collection contain ruins or markers, most Colorado ghost towns and sites display only faint traces of their former lives, if any visible ruins at all. However, just because little remains, the history of the site may be no less important. By evoking the names of the past through museum exhibitions, educational programs, and the placement of historical markers, dead, forgotten places live on in the memory of the living. May we never forget our fading echoes.